Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our first webinar of 2023. Thank you all. You're a great community, and we hope this year we'll, we'll be teaching you and presenting you more artists and lots of interesting tips and tricks from Play Studio Paint. Today, our webinar will be presented by Ifa Yusri, and she'll be talking about illustrating daily references using Clip Studio Paint. Before we begin the webinar, I will share with you some housekeeping items. The webinar will be approximately one hour long. All attendees will be muted. There will be a Q&A session uh, during the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Attendees can ask questions in the GoToWebinar question box right away. Due to time constraints, not all the questions will be answered. This webinar will be recorded, and the recording will be shared on social media and will be sent via email to all registrants and attendees. The panelists for this webinar are Marie Quinones, myself, and Ifa Yusri. For those of you who connect with us for the very first time or have never heard about Clip Studio Paint, Clip Studio Paint is your all-in-one solution for studying ready to publish illustrations, comics, manga, and animations. Learn more at clipstudio.net forward slash n and graphicsly.com. Also, we'd like to invite you to interact live with us through your Instagram stories. Tag us as hashtag webinar at Umechi at Graphicsly, at Wacom, and at Clip Studio Official. We'll be sharing your Instagram stories if you tag us. Ifa Yusri, also known as Umechi, is an 18 year old artist who is currently taking a gap year before university to explore her options in the art industry. She's known for her realistic digital food illustrations, but she also does anime art as well as traditional fine art. After upgrading to Cliff Studio Paint in 2020, she noticed a significant increase in her in the quality of her illustrations. So with that, I will leave you with Ifa and her presentation, illustrating daily references using Cliff Studio Paint. Thank you so much. So thank you for that introduction. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Aoife and I'll be the host of this webinar today. I'd like to thank all of you for taking your time out of your schedule to join me here. I hope a lot of you will be able to benefit from this. Today I'll be teaching you guys about illustrating daily references in Clip Studio Paint. I've been using Clip Studio Paint for around two or three years now. We'll be going over my process of how I turn this reference picture into an illustration like this. Uh, and what techniques and methods I use to make my work look realistic. So first off, I'd like to start with a little biography about myself. I'm an 18 year old Malaysian artist who draws realistic food illustrations. Although I'm mainly known for my food art on Instagram, I also delve into a lot of other art mediums and genres. Here are a few. So I really recommend exploring other mediums. Even if you don't like them or aren't good at them, you will definitely be able to pick up a few techniques or ideas that will help you in your digital art. My current food art style uses a lot of the things I learned during traditional art, such as the brush strokes and the mark making. So here are a few artists where I get my inspiration from. Uh, we've got Mao Mo Miji, who is one of the food artists that I look up to most. Their work is just so vibrant and the food just looks so appetizing. I love the way they put those bright highlights that make the food really glossy. They're definitely one of my biggest inspirations. On the right, we've got Kun 333R, and I absolutely love their use of bright colors. They paint in such a way that such dynamic and different colors can sit next to each other in harmony. Here in the cherries, we have oranges blending with purples, creating a high contrast of color, which makes this piece just so 
interesting to look at. They are an absolute genius with color. And lastly, I've got a traditional artist who is quite well known, James Gurney. He does tutorials on gouache painting and how to understand light and color in many different situations. I think a quality of a good artist is that you also have an eye for art and are able to understand other artists' works just by looking at them. For this reason, I'm always analyzing other artists' drawings to see what techniques they use and how they portray their art. Why did they use this color? How did they get that effect? What does the artist want to make you feel? I always ask myself these questions when looking at another artist's illustrations. The best way to improve is to learn from others. So first I'd like to go over how I started observational drawing. Observational drawing is basically seeing what's in front of you. In my opinion, a good artist must be able to draw what is in front of them first by learning about shapes, forms, and perspective. This way, when they become more advanced, they will be able to understand, exaggerate, and stylize what they are drawing in a more expressive way. But first, you've got to get the basics right. When I was about 10, so still a beginner to drawing, my art teacher taught me observational drawing. And first, we started with sketching cardboard boxes. Simple, right? Not so much, actually. I was pretty much used to doing quite free and creative art before that, so drawing boxes sounded boring to me. However, I realize now that it was necessary for me to learn about. First of all, it teaches you the basics of perspective. It's actually not easy to get it right at first. The only thing I was allowed to use was a pencil and some drawing paper. No erasers were allowed so that we could properly see our mistakes and correct them properly. Then we gradually started moving on to some more complex shapes and forms. So I really recommend that if you are a beginner, start from observational drawing and slowly build up on that. Let's get on to the process of how I make my illustrations now. So first you'll need a high quality and well-composed reference. The quality of my reference really affects how my final drawing will turn out. That's why it's essential for me to take a good reference photo of exactly what I want to draw and capture. Some people ask me where I get my references from. Uh, I take them mostly myself, or if I can, then I use Pinterest. A good photo should have all of the elements arranged in a way that is comprehensible and clear to the viewer. This is fundamentally the composition of the artwork. I mean, there are always things that you, that you can add or edit out whilst at drawing as well. A good composition will make you look at every single corner of the painting. I like to have some elements in the background just to make the piece look more interesting and draw your attention towards it. For example, in this one, I really like the lemon trees in the background. They add more complexity and color to the photo. So once you've gone in a good photo, you can go ahead and start drawing. First, I start with a simple, clean sketch to map out the subjects. Avoid spending too much time on small details and spend more time on the overall look of it. You can see I don't really fuss too much about the smaller mistakes like this overlap over here because I'll be covering everything up with paint later on anyways. The sketch should just be a guideline for where you're going to start painting. The main purpose of it for me is to mostly figure out the perspective because that can get a little tricky. To get good at this, you've got to understand the basic forms and shapes behind what you are drawing. So here for the plastic drinks, I just imagine them as cylinders and the ice cream mochi here, I understand as one long cuboid and then split into three sections later. Next is probably the most important stage of my drawing process. It's when I block in the colors. 
You can see that on all of my speed paints that I post on Instagram, I'll always do color blocking first. It's around a five minute-ish process of where I put down the rough colors and look at it from afar before I go into the tiny details. This is essential for me because it forces me to focus on the overall look. Sometimes when I jump straight into the details, I get a little carried away and the final piece looks quite different from what I imagined. So to prevent this, I block in the bigger colors and values first until I'm satisfied. Uh, when you're doing this, don't worry if it gets messy, just concentrate on the colors and values. I've had a lot of DMs or comments saying that they saw I did color blocking on my speed paints and they started to try it too and it worked really well for them. So I definitely recommend it. During this color blocking stage, it's also good to start adding some tonal depth to your drawing. Your drawing needs to be easy to understand even from far away. That's why you've got to get the tones right. Even though, for example, in this one, you can't really tell what some of the things in the rough painting are, it is still obvious what's in the background and what's in the foreground. You can clearly see that this glass cup is in front of the plant pot. And this is because of the shadows that they make. I usually start with the darkest values and then work upwards. So here I started with the chairs in the background and then the table, then the plates, and then the food. Make sure to pay attention to the lighting too. Which direction is it coming from? Where are the shadows being cast? It's good to understand these if you want to elevate the level of your painting. You can see that in some of my drawings, like this souffle one, I don't change much from the rough color blocking in the background. For this one, I just left it because I like the contrast between those blocky brush strokes and small details in the food. I think there is also beauty in the looser, less controlled brush strokes as well. Not everything has to be fully rendered and packed with detail. It also means that less attention goes towards these spaces, which is good, so that the focal point is the glossy, intricate food. So we're going to head over to Clip Studio Paint now, and I'll show you a few of my brushes. So this is the brush that I usually use. It's one of my favorite brushes, and it's called the flat brush. Um, it's perfect for me because I can really easily control whether you want it to be high opacity or low opacity. Uh, so you get this kind of like nice smooth blending gradient, which is really useful for me when painting my food art. Uh, another brush that I use is this uh, multiple squares one. And it kind of adds more texture to your brush strokes and detail. So it makes your brush strokes look more interesting. I do prefer more blocky brushes as it allows me to focus less on detail and more on form and tonal values. But this brush can also blend if I want it to. So like if I have a red and I want to blend some blue into it. It's just easy for me to transition between those colors. So after the color blocking stage, I start on the details. What I focus on most when doing this is textures and how I'm going to express it with my brush marks. Including a range of textures in your drawing makes it more realistic and believable, especially in food art. So how do you convey texture? Usually I like to think of how the light hits the object and what the texture would cause the light to do. Let's take strawberries and break it down as an example. So here I have my reference picture. Um, and now strawberries, they're very difficult to draw because they're so intricate and detailed. So it can be quite tricky to capture its form. 
There are so many aspects of the strawberry that we need to consider while strong it, such as the seeds, the small pits that hold the seeds, and the gradient of color near the stem. That's why I'll show you the steps I follow when painting strawberries. And this is the best technique that I could develop after drawing numerous amounts of strawberries. We'll be using this as a reference photo. So firstly, um, I've already painted everything, but I've split it up into layers so that you can easily see the process. So first of all, I painted the cake and the cream in the background, like so. Um, notice the shadows and their colors. I'll explain more about shadows later. So first thing I start with when painting is just imagine it as a 3D polygon and block out your colors like this. Just ignore the details for now. So the light is coming from this direction and hitting the strawberry here. So that would make it the brightest part of the strawberry. Then gradually block in the darker areas like over here, paying close attention to the shape. It's almost like a triangular pyramid like this. Yeah. So once you've got that done, you can go into the details. And what I start with first is incorporating the texture of the strawberry like this. Uh, and where the colors intersect, like along here, I try to paint these little like ovals um, and that conveys the texture. And those are supposed to be like the grooves of the seed pits. And you don't have to paint every single hole, just a few prominent ones is fine. Uh, next, add the seeds in. And note how as the seeds get nearer to the edges of the strawberry, they get closer to one another. This gives us the illusion that the strawberry is actually curved. I tend to exclude the seeds in the shadowy parts over here, simply because there's less light bouncing around in the area, so less information for our eyes to receive. This gives the effect of shadows, and obviously vice versa, the brighter parts of the strawberry will have more detail because there's more light shining onto them. So after the seeds, I paint in the highlights. And this is the most important part as it stands out the most. You can see the shape of the strawberry seed pits more clearly with this. So I exaggerated it a lot more from the reference photo. The shapes that they make are kind of like these round diamonds that connect to each other. And another part of the strawberry is the reflected light over here. Uh, it makes a huge difference and convinces your eyes that this is a 3D object. This is called ambient light because it's not directly from the source. This light has traveled from over here, collided with the cake, and then reflected onto the strawberry. So this is ambient light because it's not directly from the source, which is the sun in this case. I usually use a blue or gray color when painting this and then lower the opacity of the layer. Just look at the difference with and without the ambient light. It makes a huge difference. And it also gives us some more visual information from the shadowy part. Oh, and don't forget the ambient light over here that's reflecting on the plate onto the strawberry. Um, it's only a very small amount, but it still makes a big difference to your painting. Um, moving on, we have a layer here for the cream on the strawberry. 
And lastly, I have a layer for some of the final touch up highlights. And that is my full process for rendering a strawberry. So I wanted to explain a little something about the shadows in this piece. I exaggerated them to be a little more vibrant than in the reference photo, since the gray in there looks a little dull. Uh, what I want to zoom in on here is these two parts. Uh, the shadow on the cream and the reflection on the plate. So because of the warm yellow natural lighting in this photo, the shadow on the cream would be yellow, hence the yellow hue on the color wheel over here. However, when we get closer to the strawberry, it becomes more tinted with red. And this is because of the bouncing light. This only occurs when two objects are very close together. Here, the red light mixes with the yellow shadow, giving us an orangish gray. This is because light rays inherit the colors of what they bounce off of. Notice that it's only a small tinge of red, not as deep red as a strawberry as once the light is reflected, it's pretty weak because light rays lose their energy as they travel. That's why ambient light such as this is going to be a lot less strong than the direct light from a source. Also, if you look over here at these really dark parts, um, these are places where neither direct light or ambient light hits. So it's the darkest part of the painting. This is called our ambient occlusion, the section where no light can reach because it's such a small space. So if you're painting two objects that are next to each other, just remember to include that reflected light in the shadows to make it more realistic. Another thing I'd like to go through is glass. So over here. So here's a reference photo of a glass cup with water in it. First, I painted the objects behind it. So in this case, the table, the bottle, and the wooden block behind it. Um, now to paint glass, an important thing to note is the distortion of the objects in the background. Now, because this is a curved glass, the distortion is going to be very prominent. Whereas compared to some flat glass, you will barely get any. So on this first layer, I have the deformed background. And notice this part over here. Um, the distortion is particularly strong here because it's relatively the most curved part of the cup in our perspective. You can see that the table color is cutting into the wooden block behind it, conveying the curvature to the viewer. So at this part in the middle, it looks mostly flat to us. And there won't be that much distortion, only a slight shift like over here and over here. So next, we're going to paint the water. And this is going to be more difficult because water is less predictable than glass, which is a good thing that we have our reference photo. The objects behind the cup are going to appear even more distorted now and from a different angle because of the refraction of water. This is because the water is denser than air, so the light is going to travel through it slower. Thus, we see the objects behind from a different angle than normal. Next, I would continue by adding in the reflectional parts. So here I've painted the rim of the cup, which varies from a dark bluish to a white highlight. Also notice the difference in line thickness. This white line at the back is extremely thin compared to the rest of the brush strokes in the painting. This is what makes the illustration so convincing. Varying line width just makes it look more detailed and realistic from afar. 
And lastly, we're going to add in our final highlights to really bring in everything together. I like to change between these simple dot highlights and also these kind of hatching lines to give more variation. And don't forget the shadow of the cup to finish it off. You can also use this technique for shiny objects or metals too, since they are pretty similar. Another tip I'd like to mention is to incorporate hard and soft edges. When I'm painting, I like to contrast these two since it makes the painting much more attention grabbing and more interesting to look at. If we go back to my strawberry study here, um, this here would be considered a hard edge where you can clearly see the boundary between two colors. And over here, it would be considered a soft edge because the colors are blended and transition more smoothly into each other. So smooth edges convey continuity, whereas hard edges convey ending. If all the edges in the painting are the same, the end result will be pretty dull. That's why I don't recommend only shading with an airbrush. Um, by varying between different types of edges, there is more uniqueness and personality in the piece. Another type of edge is what I like to call an, a lost edge. So this is where you can not distinguish the ending boundary of the object. Take, for example, this part of the strawberry over here. You can clearly differentiate between the edge of the strawberry and the cream, whereas if we follow along here, it gets lost between these two objects. And then the lost edge reappears again here. By incorporating lost and found edges in your works, you can make the piece look more realistic. Our eyes are naturally drawn to sharp edges first. That's why you can experiment with this when you want to try and draw the viewer's attention to a particular subject. For example, if I take my eyedropper tool and go here, the values of where the cream meets the cake are pretty similar. But if we go over here to this hard edge, um, there's a much more bigger contrast between these values. So this way, our eyes are more focused on the strawberry than what's in the background. So after getting in all those details, the last thing I like to do when finishing my artworks are final touch-ups which are mostly adding some highlights and adjusting the color. I also recommend that you take a short break because when you're working on an art piece for so long, um, our eyes tend to adjust to the mistakes in the drawing and we don't notice them anymore. Whereas if you come back later and look back at your drawing with a fresher perspective, it's much easier for you to spot these mistakes and fix them. What I like to do as well is to transfer the drawing to my phone as a PNG, then look at it every once in a while to see what I can improve on. Another part of my touch-up process is using these layer modes to adjust color or saturation. I don't do this with every piece, only when I need to. So first I put all of my layers into a folder and then copy them and then merge them together. And you can do this by changing it to a blending mode. So the ones I use most often are overlay, multiply and add. So I use overlay to make my pieces look more vibrant or also if I'm going for a specific color scheme like a warm palette. 
So if I'm going with a warm palette, I choose an orangish yellow color like this for my blending layer. Um, put it on alpha lock and get my pen and fill it. Oops. Then you lower the opacity over here and it gives the effect of maybe like golden lighting. Um, and for multiply, it increases the intensity and darkness of a color. So I'm going to go to multiply here. If I make it a little darker, it just makes everything a bit more saturated. Uh, and I usually use it for shadows. So if I want to make something darker, I'll use multiply. And for add, it lightens all the colors. So if I choose the light color here, I usually choose like a light yellow because usually the light is a bright yellow. So yeah, that would make everything brighter and give the illusion that there's some very bright lighting. So another final touch-up I do is I use Gaussian Blur if necessary. I actually found out this function in Clip Studio Paint quite recently, so it hasn't been applied to my old works like this one. Here I would use the Gaussian blur in the background to make the table and food the focal point. So I would go to a filter here, blur, and Gaussian blur this layer. And here you can adjust the strength of the blur. So if I want it like really high, I'm not sure when you would use that though. It would be like that but I usually like to keep it around here-ish, so that much. I think around here is nice. Uh, and yeah, that way it's easier for you to focus your attention on the food. However, Ga Gaussian blur can also be used in the foreground as well. For example, here on this cat commission I did, I use the Gaussian blur everywhere except the cat's face, helping to frame it. It just feels nicer on your eyes because there are less visual distractions. So yeah, those are the touch-ups that I do before I'm finished with my paintings. So something a lot of people ask me about is color. In my drawings, I usually use colors similar to the reference, but there are some times where I stray from the reference and try to incorporate some different colors to make it more interesting. Uh, for example, in this piece, the reference had dark brown shadows under the plates, but I decided to change it to blue because I wanted to give the piece a more vibrant look. I also like how the blue juxtaposes with the light yellow table. I also added little bits of blue everywhere, like reflecting on the cup over here and over here, on the pudding and in like everywhere in the background. It just makes the warmer colors, such as the ones on the pudding or on the matcha drink here, pop out more. Using color contrast like this is a good strategy for making unique and captivating paintings. Usually I use complementary color pairs. Now, complementary colors are colors that if you mix them, they will come out gray because they cancel each other out. They are directly opposite each other on the color wheel. However, if you put them next to each other, they create a strong contrast and bring each other out more. So these would be colors like red and green, yellow and purple, and blue and orange. And as you can see here, this table is 
as this hue, this yellow. And if I color pick from the shadow over here, it's directly opposite each other. It forms like a straight line over here. Um, so I'll also explain some basics on what you need to know about color mixing and colors in general. So here's some simple definitions. First, we've got hue. So hue is basically a color group. When you are moving the color wheel around like this, you're changing the hue. Nothing's going on in this box area. You're only moving this around, just changing the original color. And next is saturation. Now, saturation is the intensity of that hue. Here we've got a gray color getting more and more saturated into blue. So essentially, that would be moving in a horizontal direction in our color box here. So it starts off at gray. And as the saturation increases, we're getting more and more blue in it. And lastly, we've got value. This is how dark or light the color will be. So this is basically the vertical direction. So light color getting darker. And that's your value. So now that that's out of the way, I can explain how to choose your colors. A lot of people ask me about this, and honestly, there's no right answer because it depends on what you intend to portray. Although I can give a few tips. So here are some colors that I picked from one of my art pieces, which is this one. I just like picked a few randomly from different parts of the painting and arrange them like this. So over here is another color palette. Now, if I asked you which palette looks better to look at, you'd say the bottom one, right? Actually, if I take my eyedropper tool here and color pick, you'll see that the top color and the bottom color has the same hue this part on the color wheel just doesn't change. And so if they have the same hues, why is that the bottom palette looks better than the top one? That's because we took out the saturation and value. If you imagine this as painting with real paint that comes from tubes, the way you would mix this bottom color, this one over here, is by getting some orange paint and adding black and white, so basically gray. But these top colors here would just be the plain orange paint by itself without any gray. The reason why these top colors don't work is because we took the gray out of them. All colors are connected together by gray. So that's why when picking your colors, I recommend that you stick to a large range of values and saturation. And don't forget our values and saturation are over here. So try to stay away from picking strong colors like these that only have hues. They clash too much and there are too, there are too many bright colors that our eyes can't handle. Also try and include a broad range of saturation and value in your paintings. So like this, if you watch the color wheel, um, all of the colors are distributed quite like randomly over the middle area of the box over here. You see that I don't really use strong colors like this or like over here. I try to keep them in this middle area. So having a large range of tonal values in your painting matters as well. Your painting should still look good even if you change it to grayscale. Um, over here, I did a little lighting and value study. 
Um, this is a good exercise if you want to practice getting the tones right in your art. As you can see, I have a range of values from extremely light to very dark. And another part of this exercise for me was using different brushes, like these rough paint-like ones on the edge here that add some flair to the painting. Um, this is also good for understanding lighting and how it interacts with objects like these clothing folds over here. And yeah, it's just a really fun study to do because you can add your own style to the study as well. It's not just like directly copied from the reference, you also add your own personality into it. So the brushes I used here, um, one that I really like is this brush. And oh, I painted everything on the same layer here because it just feels more like oil painting or traditional art, which I'm more used to. And I think it's more fun that way and that way you're not fussing over layers. And this brush just adds more texture to your painting. So you can see that I try to like range between this, the subject being overlapped by the background and also the subject overlapping the background. So it's kind of hard to tell like what's in front and what's behind. So this part would be in front. This part looks like, no, this, yeah, this one would look like it's behind. It's being blocked by this white color. And I think that's also a pretty cool way to like make your study is more interesting. So I like contrasting these really small details and really carefully painted parts with small brush strokes. And then this kind of reckless random brush strokes here. And yeah, I think this is a really good exercise for practicing that. So yeah, that's pretty much all the things I wanted to go over today. Um, I really hope you guys learned something from this and enjoyed the webinar. I'd also like to thank Graphicsly as well for making this possible. So now I think it's the Q&A with Mario. Yes, Sifa. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been a really impressive presentation. Everyone loved it. Uh, so thank you. No problem. Also, <laughs> also uh, the references are delicious. So we all got really hungry. And, <laughs> and uh, we ask from where, uh, from the globe, where uh, were you watching us? Uh, so we, we want to thank, for example, Chantil from USA, uh, Plamen from Denmark, uh, Isabella from Chile, Sarah from Iran, Brie from Guam, Alejandra from Mexico, Sarah from Iran, uh, people from Canada like Daniel, uh, um, California, Austria, Sweden, Sydney, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So thank you all who joined us today, and uh, let's go with some questions. Uh, everybody was really impressed uh, because you said you are 18. <laughs> so oh. one of the questions was uh, from Karen: uh, What age did okay. you start doing digital art? Um, I think I started around 15 or maybe around 14. Like I remember my getting my first tablet, which is like one of those small Wacom ones, which aren't display ones. But yeah, I was really excited about that because it was my first digital way to draw. Before that, I'd always been using traditional. Yeah. And then recently I've 
like kept on doing digital because I think it's just more efficient and I I rely on the undo button so yeah mm -hmm. and uh, another question was uh, MB how long uh, how much time does it take you to finish uh, a drawing uh, well different drawings take me different amounts of time if I go to this one I think this one took me around two or three days to complete so maybe around eight hours ish um i don't know if that's fast or quick but then when i get to smaller drawings like these um it will take me around maybe a day or a half uh and these studies these only take me like around two hours maybe I think for this one, it only took me about one hour. But yeah, it really depends on like what you're drawing and how small you want to go, like how much detail you want in it. Um, I think one of my other pieces, this one, this one was a bit crazy because like, I think it took me around four days of like very dedicated hours to get all those tiny details in it. It's definitely the most detailed piece I've done like in digital art. So yeah, but obviously as you practice, you're gonna get more quick at doing pieces. So yeah. And uh, when do you decide when to stop? Like <laughs> when you think, okay, this is enough <laughs> detail. I think it's ready. Hmm. I, I think I stop when I see enough detail in there. So like, or maybe just when I'm sick of it, like I spent so <laughs> long on these strawberries and I was like, oh uh, yeah, I need to move on because these are very time consuming and yeah, it was fun doing these strawberries, but then there's like, let's see about 15 strawberries in this painting. And yeah, so yeah, I basically stop when I can't do any more painting. <laughs> and Gabrielle, uh, she asks, uh, what is your mm -hmm. favorite part of the process while painting your references? Ooh, my favorite part of the painting. Um, for that, I think it would be doing the final highlights because it's kind of nice to see everything come together. And the highlights, they don't really affect, like if you put them in the wrong place, um, they don't really affect your drawing too much so it's fun for me because it's really free and just interesting to see where these highlights go as well and there's a lot of different shapes and like types of highlights so like in this on the right here in that cheesecake packaging you can see like how much fun I had there with those highlights. Um, there's some transparent-ish ones there and there's some really strong, weirdly shaped ones, which were quite interesting to draw. So yeah, I think highlights are definitely my favorite part of the drawing process because um, they're just so different and diverse. Mm-hmm. And, and there are a lot of questions about your references and if you take pictures and how do you, for example, Andrea asks, how do you not um, contain yourself of eating your references if you go to a lot of <laughs> yeah. uh, bakeries or, um, or coffee shops? That's very difficult because whenever I see these foods at bakeries and um, cafes, I'll always be so tempted to buy every single one of them. So like these desserts in this photo uh, painting, 
um I was like standing there for a very long time getting photos and yeah uh, over here whenever I go to these restaurants I'll always go with my family or my sisters and we'll spend a long time taking photos and not touch the food for about like five minutes after the food gets to our table so yeah it's quite difficult but it's fun in the end mm -hmm. and, and maybe I, I can link this with the uh, yen li shan question uh, thank you mm -hmm. so much for your presentation i would like to ask how do you maintain your passion to draw do you have any moment that you feel discouraged to draw or do you overcome this oh definitely like I get art block quite often because when I draw, I'll always like spend a long period of time on it and I'll be very dedicated to it. So I'll spend, I'll be thinking about it like the whole day. So that's why art block hits me quite often, especially after this piece, I think I got quite like bad art block and um, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing because it's telling your yourself to rest and like maybe take a break from drawing for a while. Um, so how to overcome art block? Yeah, I'd just say take a break and you'll naturally feel like you want to start drawing again. You'll, yeah, I always get that. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. And also there are a lot of questions about your brushes. Do you purchase them? Do you download them for free from the assets? Yeah, I studio? download them for free from assets. Uh, usually I just search in what I'm looking for. So like, um, I think these brushes, I just search like painting, oil painting, and yeah, there's like tons of brushes on Clip Studio assets. It's actually insane. Like even for such specific things like um, flower, I have a brush for flower um, like this to do like those flower effects on my desserts. Um, I have like a lot of brushes for that uh which can all be found on clip studio assets which is one of the reasons why i love clip studio paint because they have brushes for everything really and it's just more efficient for me because i don't have to spend like so much time getting those specific things right and yeah it's just more efficient Mm -hmm. And um, another question from Sandra Yaram, Yaram Madi, sorry if I <laughs> mispronounce it. Uh, how can I learn to pick colors without using eyedropper on the reference picture? Um, I think you've just got to eyeball it. Like you'll get better at this as you do more studies. So I think, yeah, it just comes with practice, definitely. Um, if you like learn more about tonal values you and saturation, you'll get it eventually. So yeah, some another exercise I like to do as well is when doing these, um, I'll pick the color first here. Like I'll try to estimate where around it would be, like what tone it will be, and then I'll color pick from here and see, oh, it was actually this tone. So like, I'll see how close I can get it. And honestly, it doesn't have to be exact. Just as long as they're relative to each other, it's okay. But obviously, if you can get it as close as you can, that would be a good thing as well. Um, and for color, I think color, you don't have to necessarily get the same color as your study. 
Um, because I also think that's a bit boring as well. Like for me, yeah, I also I also try to get the same colors, but I at the same time I do try to get some different colors as well, especially in this one. Like it just gives your piece much more personality. And I think there is also beauty in what colors you choose and what colors you decide because in the end those decisions you make are what go towards your painting and what make your painting like your painting. Mm -hmm. And then there was a few questions regarding uh, where you put the image of your reference. Uh, many of uh, our audiences, uh, they ask if you use the sub view panel. Uh, we saw that you also mirror the canvas. You flip it from oh. one side to the other. Oh yeah, I definitely flip my canvas very, very often to check for mistakes. Um, as for my reference, I usually put it on my phone and then put my phone on my drawing tablet because I'm not used to it that way. And I get to like zoom in a lot as well there, I think. So, and it takes up less room on my workspace because I like having, I'm very used to this workspace. So I just put the references on my phone and especially because I, do like switch between different references as well. So it's just easier for me to use my phone's photo gallery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and can you show us uh, how to flip the canvas? Many of uh, uh, other people oh, yeah. are <laughs> a bit lost. <laughs> uh, you just go here to Navigator um, and you'll have this thing where you can control your view. And over here, you'll have these reflective icons. This would be flipping it horizontally, so like this. And this one would be vertically. Yeah. Um, I always recommend flipping horizontally, especially if you're drawing faces or symmetrical things like this, because you can spot your mistakes very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, here's another question from Michael. Thank you so much. You are a great tutor for sharing your brilliant observational abilities and excellent renderings. What were the main challenges when you converted from physical or traditional art to digital art? Best wishes. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Mm -hmm. Um, my challenges were definitely because when you do digital art, it's easy to like get no texture. So when I first started, I think I only used like a watercolor brush and a, like literally the pen brush. So I was shading and everything with this, which is okay, but um, as I mentioned before, there is not much texture and there is not much like detail I can get with that. Whereas when, so that's like what I struggled with when I first started digital because I was used to immediately getting that texture when using oil paint or like, like real brushes. Uh, but then when I got Clip Studio, I downloaded like these new brushes and yeah it helps me overcome that very flat um kind of drawing kind of painting style so now my stuff my art just doesn't look as flat as it used to so i'd recommend getting new brushes or textured brushes as well Mm -hmm. There's another interesting question, more personal one mm -hmm. from Andrea. She's, she says, uh, you're on a quick break from schooling at the present, but do you have any plan where you'd like to end up your art career? Oh, so currently I'm taking a gap year 
Um, I'm just exploring having art as like a main, my main focus. But next year, I oh no, this year, I think I'll be going back to uni, well, to, to uni for the first time. And I might be doing engineering, but I'll definitely be doing art on the side as well. And I will definitely keep drawing. Maybe if I can get like a stable income from my art, uh, then I will do it full time. But for now, I will be doing engineering on the side as well. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we wish you the best. And one last uh, question is mm -hmm. any advice for people who are still uh, struggling with drawing references what would you say to them hmm, and drawing references so um yeah like i said before in at the start of the webinar i think uh try drawing from real life or like observational drawing because that's also how i started i used to be really bad at like capturing forms and like observational drawing. I used to hate it because I liked drawing character art and I thought, why should I be drawing like objects, like boxes and stuff when I could be drawing like cute characters or something more fun. But then I did realize that actually you need to understand those basic forms as well before starting if you really want to get good at like whatever you like drawing so for me when I was at that age I liked drawing like characters and anime art so yeah it actually improved my anatomy a lot more you you should also do anatomy studies as well um honestly yeah studies and practice are gonna get you a long way uh that's some advice i have well with those wise words and thank you so much ifa for this amazing amazing webinar uh, you mentioned with me this is your first webinar so kudos to you yeah. it's been excellent <laughs> everybody enjoyed it we all enjoyed it and before we go, we'd like to share one last bit of information. Learn more about Clip Studio Paint. Uh, visit our Clip Studio Paint website, clipstudio.net forward slash n and graphicsly.com. Many of you asked, yes, this webinar has been recorded and will be shared on our YouTube channel, Clip Studio Paint channel, and graphicsly. So don't forget to subscribe to get a notification once it's available to watch. And also to follow Ifa's career. Uh, and more information about her, follow her in her socials as mmechi, e, uh, the same on Twitter and TikTok. So with that, thank you all who joined us and thanks again, Nifa, for this wonderful webinar. Yep, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, and see you next time. Stay tuned. Bye-bye. <laughs>